Welcome to Your Own Park is his debut collection of short stories. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Carmona. And um, it started with uh, one little story, which is uh, one to start with. It's called Strange Leads, which was the uh, Texas Observer Short Story Contest, the third finalist. And so there was five of them that won, and I was the third one. And so that one was kind of uh, the story itself is um, it's about the refugee crisis in this country, and. Um, and, you know, the stories that uh, I got were compiled from when I went to spend a little bit of time at the uh, refugee center in down the valley. There's two of them. One of them is Sacred Hearts, which is where the story takes place, part of it. And the other one's the Immaculate Conception in Brownsville. And these are all um, voluntary. There's no government funding whatsoever. There's actually no funding except for what's called what's donated. And so everybody who runs these centers 24-7. Are doing it out of their own, basically, their own kindness to be able to do that. And then they just take donations and they help these refugees, um, basically with clothing, with food, with legal advice. Because um, when they get here, the Border Patrol really doesn't tell them anything. Um, and a lot of them lie to them and make them sign papers that they shouldn't have signed. And so it costs, and so that's what they offer. Um, but a friend of mine, um, is the, I don't know what her exact title is, but she's like the program relations director for the, the Catholic Charities or the diocese, and she was quite partially one of the people that ran that center. And so she took me in, and then we went to go, we collected, talked to the people, the volunteers, and you know, so the story, the first one, the one that actually ended up in the Observer, is a compilation of stories I heard from this, um, from what, when, from what happened to these refugees. So um, with that, I mean, this uh, most of this the collection of this, of this uh, is really about the Rio Grande Valley from about 2005 to 2014. And the reason it stops in 2014 is because that's when I sent it to the publisher. <laughs> you know, so it's only about 10 years. And the reason I chose to do that, um, one reason is because I read um, Benjamin Signs, Everything Begins and Ends at the Kentucky Globe which is um, his collection of short fiction about El Paso Juarez. And it's dealing with the same time frame. And I realized that the Valley didn't have any fiction about that time. Most of the stuff coming out, the fiction coming out from, from them is about the 90s or the 80s. And so nobody had really written stories about what's happening in the past 10 years in the Rio Grande Valley. So that's really what sparked it was reading his collection and thinking, you know, so it's basically an inspiration to I need to write about what the experiences are. Because in a lot of ways, there's a mirror that happens. But it doesn't get talked about a lot because El Paso and Juan is, it's, you know, and Benjamin wrote a beautiful book. Um, but, um, so this is where this comes from. Interesting that this is not the original title. This is what the publisher chose. And this, this, this has been the one of the, the story that this is title of um, actually doesn't even take place in the valley. <laughs> But it's a much better title, I think, <laughs> because it's got the, it's the road to Yorona Park. So the Yorona Park is actually a real place. It's a real place in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, so it's not made up. It's a real place. It doesn't, it's not as interesting as it sounds when you go out to the park. Um, <laughs> it's really not. It's just like a strip along the Rio Grande. It's got like a little play area, and then it's just green, and that's it. <laughs> There's really, the, the only way you know it's Yorona Park is because a little plaque that tells you the story of Yorona, and that's it. But, you know, it's like there's a Yorona Park out there, so it's like amazing <laughs> to even have that. But, so this is kind of where the title came from, what the story, the collection of these stories are. Um, 
So I'm going to start with this one. So Strange Leaves is a reference to something. Um, well, obviously, if I'm not to, uh, to Strange Fruit. But um, there's a phenomenon, I don't know if we all know about this, something that's called rape trees. Um, rape trees are, um, all right, so it's, it's kind of, they're like uh, spaces, and usually around where they're past the checkpoint system, and it's mostly ranch land. And that's where the coyotes basically, uh, put bluntly, they, they rape these women, these immigrant women. And they make them hang their bras and their panties from the tree. And it's a way to kind of mark where they've been, also to kind of compete with the other coyotes. It's, it's pretty horrific. Um, so Strange Leaves is, is a reference to the red trees. So this is written in a little bit different style. But, um, so we'll start here. It's called, the chapters are broken up in hashtags. Hashtag Immigration Shuffle. Steps off bus downtown McCallum after surrendering to Border Patrol. Given a ticket to see judge in three to six months. Options are simple. Take the bus ride to detention center deep in the U.S. or report to refugee center located two blocks south of the bus station. She barely understands and she only knows a few words of English and not much more Spanish. She mostly spoke Quechua. She mostly gestures and points on the Border Patrol map. She points at a church, a symbol she knows well. The Cruz Blanco, the White Cross. Salvation, she hopes. She walks down the city block filled with tiendas, parking garages, and loud blasting of the new music. Streets are different, yet somehow the same. Many brown faces, a few white ones, but not too many. She was expecting English. This place is more Spanish, more Mexican. Maybe I'm not in America yet, she thinks. But she keeps on walking to the church. She gets to the first building that looks like a church white with big wooden cross on steeple. Has to be it, she thinks. Tries the door, it's locked. Hears footsteps. Older woman with glasses answers door, opens it just a bit, enough for half her face. Can I help her? Can I help you, she asks. No, I'm the English, I'm the Espanol, she asks. Si, me quita que quieres. Está buscando sacred heart. She nods in her head while the woman explains where to go. Strange, she thinks, she never opened the door all the way. Just enough for her to talk, and shut it hard and fast. Walks past two buildings until she rounds a corner and sees six big tents with giant air conditioners, making its plastic walls shake. Red Cross truck sits just past the gate. TV news vans with names like Telemundo, Galavision, and Univision are at the door where the woman with blue vests tell her where to go. The women in blue vests um, are never good. The woman in blue vest never got off the phone. Everyone speaks Spanish here. She walks into the building where the women all have blue vests or everywhere. Clothes in piles, tables with food, tables with toothpaste, brushes, and deodorants. No one says anything to her at first, but then a young girl with her bun in her hair walks up to her and says, Hola, puedo ayudar. She explains her story to her, but the, the girl, to the girl with her hair in her bun, Takes long, long walks in desert, riding on top of trains, same shoes, same clothes, same everything for days. The girl tells her many things, some she doesn't understand. She only knows Spanish a little, but when she attempts to tell the girl she doesn't speak Spanish, well, the girl cuts her off. The girl tells her, shows her to her room with a small shower and a plastic curtain. She smiles for the first time in weeks. The girl tells her that she will have new clothes when she's done. She smiles again. She takes her shower and sees new clothes waiting for her on the chair. She puts them on, feels like a new person, no longer dirty, no longer she. The girl with her hair in a bun comes around the corner and asks her why no, why no bra and panties. The look comes over her face and takes her back to the she she was before the shower. She looks at the girl and tells her that the coyotes made her hang them from the tree after. The girl with her hair in a bun looks horrified becomes speechless. She looks at the girl, steps closer, and tells her that's okay. She smiles because she took a pill before. No baby. Hashtag, rape trees are real. This is written in a telegram. From Halden to Rowena, from the valley to Albuquerque. Message, I heard a strange sound when I was on the road stop. 
It was night, you know, somewhere around King Ranch stop. I was definitely south of the study at the checkpoint stop. Had pulled over to take a piss and I heard a woman scream stop. Didn't know exactly what it was stop. At first I thought it was a coyote or maybe a goat stop. But deep down I knew it was something horrible stop. I contemplated whether I should check it out stop. My conscience told me I had to check and so I did stop. I zipped up and turned on the flashlight app stop. I first thought I saw the shadow of three people running across the darkened brush stop. Maybe it was the ghost of immigrants that never quite made it stop. But I knew better. Walked up to the barbed wire fence stop. I knew it was ranch land and private property, but the sounds of a woman crying forced me to trespass stop. What I saw was more than anything, worse than anything I could have imagined stop. First, I saw a tree with strange leaves stop. The woman was lying on the ground wearing only a t shirt stop. No pants, no panties, just a pair of sandals and a white shirt with a pink ribbon on it. Stop. The shirt red helps in breast cancer. Stop. Don't know why it's important, but it is. Stop. She looked at me and told me in Spanish to leave her alone because they'll come back and kill us. Stop. I told her in my best broken Spanish that I had a car and I could take her where she needed to go. Stop. She looked at me, not ready to trust. Stop. She hung her bra and panties from a tree and said she couldn't go with me. Stop. The coyotes would find her and kill her. Stop. I explained that this is America and the Border Patrol only a few miles up the road. Stop. We can make it, I told her. She agreed. Stop. She followed me back to my car. Stop. I turned to look one last time. Stop. Too many bras, too many panties, too many strange leaves. Stop. My heart was pounding, waiting for the coyotes to jump out and kill us. Stop. But it never happened. She got in my car, stop. I told her my name and asked her hers, stop. She told me her name was she. I didn't argue, stop. We sped down the road to the checkpoint, pulled over, stop. Something I'd never done, flagged down the first board patrol I could find, stop. I told him my story and at first he didn't believe me, stop. But then when she corroborated, they took her inside the station, stop. I was there three hours before they let me go, stop. I asked what was going to happen to her. Stop. Border Patrol guy told me that she was going to be processed and probably let go. Stop. I couldn't believe my ears. I thought for sure they would deport her. Stop. Border Patrol guy told me to know because she was the victim of a crime and she gets a special visa. Stop. Crazy, right? I didn't know. Stop. I got to speak to her one last time and then I gave her my card. Stop. I told her I lived in McAllen and if she needed anything. Stop. Don't know if I'll ever see her again, but at least I did my good deed for the day. Stop. Hashtag, the road is always bumpy and dark. She doesn't know what to do. The road is bumpy, back of the van is packed so tight, legs are starting to cramp from me not being able to move. She closes her eyes and hopes the ride is almost over. How many in here, she asks herself. Too many, she answers. Maybe 10, maybe more. She is the only girl by herself in this van. Others are mothers and grandmothers. She was sent alone. Mother didn't want her back home. She was 14, about to be 15. Men on the streets back in Guatemala started to notice. Mother tells her she's becoming a woman now. Men didn't look at her, it was, um, sorry. She, she thought she was a woman when she first bled, but the men didn't look at her then. Now her body was aging faster in her mind. Now she is a woman. She looked around the darkened van, no real seats, no windows, just smell of people, sardine at first bothered her. Now she didn't even smell anything anymore. Other groups were made up of almost of kids almost her age, but this group was mostly grandfathers, mothers, and young men with fear in their eyes and hope in their hearts. One woman asked if she was scared. She thought it was a strange question. Aren't we all, she replies. A woman whose name is Benita Gomez touches her shoulder and smiles. Smile is more distraught than anything she's ever seen. No, she says, are you scared of these men, what they're gonna to do to you? She had not really th thought about it. She knew what the unspoken penalty was gonna be, but she had put it out of her mind for sanity. She asked Benita, are you scared? Benita looks at her and smiles. 
This time the way her mother looks at the daughter knowing there's something terrible is going to happen and she can't stop it. Rita, she says, this isn't my first ride. She just looks down and Rita holds her until the van stops and the sounds of car doors opening and closing is heard. Benita just puts something, then puts something in her hand and says, take this. She's confused and doesn't react. So Benita looks her dead in the eye and says, take it before and now. She only has one swallow left of water, and so she does this. Benita asks. She swallows the pill. It tastes bitter. Benita hugs her one last time and says, no baby, not for you. She fears her hot, tri her hot tear trickle down Benita's cheek and onto her forehead. Hashtag. Refugee girl at my doorstep. So this is the phone conversation. And they pressed it well to put the little pictures of the phone on there. <laughs> so I thank them for that. <laughs> I think they would. So Rowena, and it's the two again, Rowena and Alden. Rowena answers, yeah, Alden, I need your help. What's going on? Remember that telegraph, telegram I sent you about the girl I rescued? Yeah, that was weird. Well, she's here. What do you mean she's here? She's at my house. How'd she find you? I gave her my card. Why'd you do that? I don't know, I just did. Well, now she's your problem. I know that. How old is she? I don't know, maybe 13? Why? Because you're 35 years old, recently divorced with an underage immigrant girl in her apartment. I'm not a pedophile. I know that, but the rest of the world ain't gonna see it that way. Rowena, you gotta help me. All right, I don't know what you should do. Is there a social worker you can call? The social worker's the one that dropped her off. The social worker drove her to her house. Why would they do that? Because all she had on her was my business card. Why would you put your home address on your business card? You're a writer. There's lots of misery groups out there. I don't know. I just did. Marina, all right, tell the social worker you can't take her in. I did that already. Vanessa told me she had nowhere else to go. She has no family here. Who's Vanessa? The social worker. All right. Um, I don't know. You're in uncharted territory here. What are her options? Either go into a detention center somewhere deep in the Midwest or, or what? staying here. You want to take care of this girl, don't you? I don't know. I hear in your voice. She's not your problem. You did more than we could expect. You rescued her. But I feel responsible now. You and your conscience, they always get you in trouble. So what do I do? You already took her in, didn't you? Yes, I did. Then why are you calling? You know why. Well, I'm not your friend or your mother. You don't need my permission. Just your support. You always have that. What now? I don't know. I'll come down for the holidays. Keep me posted. So the last section. Journey begins with $5,000. She hates mama because she took all of their money. The breath like at Vesta and eyes that always undressed. Mama says Guatemala is no place for Indias Bonitas. No place for young girls like she. Not anymore. She asks, what about her? My mama always stays sign up on. She says she is much more, more important. Go to the U.S., Mama says. Go to the U.S. and have a better life. Coyote tells Mama that all she has to do is get across the Mexican border, turn herself into the U.S. Migra, and she would be free to be American. He also wants $5,000. He wanted a knife with she, but Mama wouldn't have that. Threatens to cut off levels with butcher knife. Inside. Don't know how Mama will protect her on the road. Don't know if Mama ever left that thought in vain. Don't know if she thinks she wants to. She cries all night before the truck shows up, 4 a.m. 20 others in the back of an old pickup truck. She doesn't want to leave, Mama. Mama is all she has left. Papa was killed by gang, coming home from the mines one last night. One night. At least that's what Mama thinks. One night, Papa just never came home. That was two weeks ago. Mama struggled to pay for both of them, with breach, with waitressing and making pontos there, but never enough. Don't know how Mama gets the money to pay a coyote. When asked, Mama just refuses to say. She wants to cry when she gets on the truck. Mama sees it on her face, but she doesn't cry. Mama is always strong. But just before the truck pulls away, see, she sees the single tear fall from the corner of Mama's eye, glistening in the moonlight. It's the first one. Extremely thirsty today. It's because it's like our heat in there, so much more tan out there. <laughs> That's what I heard. So, half of the stories are about 
these two, she and Hal, and this is the story, um, her introduction, and it comes kind of in the middle of the book. Um, Halden's introduction comes a little bit earlier. And uh, so half of the story is about their, their kind of lives together. So what I'm going to read you here is um, this little story, which she is a character in. It's about a year after Hal takes her in. And a strange thing to know about US law is this actually happens. Because the US immigration system is so overburdened that if someone is willing to take a child in, they'll let them. And usually the check system for that is very, very horrible. But because they're so overworked and they don't have them, they'll just do it. As long as the person has a job or something, they don't have any house criminal, they just basically sign them over. If that's what the child wants and the person wants to take them in. I didn't know that that was that easy. <laughs> but it's, there's over, when, during the summer when the story was written, there was over 4,000 um, kids that came through the county. There's only about, I think, 100 immigration judges in, these, in the US. So it's a very overburdened system right now. And so they rely on these refugee centers and people's charity, really. It's kind of a strange situation. So when people ask me that, I was like, well, is that, could that actually happen? It actually did happen. All the stories I read, actually, I mean, parts of this, they're all that could happen, all the stories I heard. The stuff afterwards, so the, right now the Valley has a huge influx of kids from Guatemala, El Salvador, and um, all the Central American territories, countries, which is changing the dynamics. So the second story I'm going to read, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's too long, but it's actually, the main character is a little kid who, um, who's a, you know, the best way to explain it is, um, he's living in, um, I guess you could call it a barrio, because it is, of Donna, which is a little town there in the Round Grand Valley. And he's just, he's, you know, his older brother's gone to jail, his parents are out of the picture, living with his grandmother. And he, and his, like his best friend, or his brother's best friend's gonna take care of him, but he's also the leader of a gang down there. So where this story picks up is initiation to be part of this gang, so and it's basically his only father figure is to steal something from a house, right? That's part of his initiation. This is also a true story, but in a very different way. Um, so what happens is that Curly, who's the main character, ends up stealing, the, the, the new couple moves into a house down the road, and they have this box, this black box, and it's got a lock on everything, so he thinks it's got to be valuable. So he steals that, but when he, when he gets it open, all it has in there is a bunch of spiral notebooks. It's, all, it's just poetry and notes. And so he's really disappointed that uh, <laughs> that's what he finds. So the story's called The Black Box. But um, so here he's actually started, he has a crush on she who was actually in the public school system. And where the story picks up, he's already kind of got his first date with her. Um, and so this is where it picks up, is right before he, he's going to go out with her. So Curly looks at the black box of notebooks again, and this time takes the spiral notebooks out and starts to read them. They're filled with poetry and notes. The poems were mostly hard for Curly to understand, so he had to download a dictionary app on his phone. He used it every time he came across a word he didn't understand. He even bought one of those little notebooks from the 99 cent store and started to write down everything. He wanted to impress she, now that she was actually talking to him. Some of the poems spoke to him. He never knew that someone else felt the same way about it, being different, and expressed it in a poetry that didn't sound anything like Robert Frost, or even that Shakespeare guy you could never understand. This stuff was talking about real life. Hey Curly, what are you reading? Curly shut the notebook like his brother had just caught him masturbating. What? It was Derek. He was uh, he's another one of the gang members there. What you got there? Uh, nothing, just some school stuff. And then why are you hiding it like porn? No, I was just you know startled. Derek looked confused for a second, took a head off his joint, and said startled. I don't think I ever heard a pop that used that word. Curly blushed a little and said, well, it's just something I read. It means, I know what it means, bro. You want to hit? Derek extended his half-smoked joint to Curly. Curly shook his head and said, nah, I got to go be somewhere. He jumped up, put the notebook back in the black box, and walked out with the box under his arm. Curly stopped before he completely exited the garage, looked back at Derek, smoking and drinking a beer. And for the first time, he thought, I don't want to be that old and still hanging out in my brother's garage. He turned and walked out. 
Curly met she at the Placita, which was a central park in an old part of the city. The jungle gym was all metal, the ground was concrete, the basketball hoops never had nets, and there was graffiti everywhere. It was a good place to meet since it was the middle ground between her house and, and his. She showed up with a copy of books, a book by a Chicano writer writing about the lost girls of Juarez. She read some poems from it and Curly really liked them. He copied them down in his little notebook. He had copied some poems down from his little notebook that he from the black box and he recited them to her. She seemed to like them. He told them that they were his and immediately he knew that was wrong, but he wanted to impress her. So he held on to the lie. She told him that her real name was Shishiwashitikwe Zapatikwazo, but in Guatemala, the, the government just called her Shi Zapateca. That is the name she always used. Curly tried to say her real name, but he failed every single time. She just laughed at him every time. Curly thought he should have been embarrassed, but he made a game of it, and they both enjoyed it. They talked for about an hour about his brother in prison and his wanting to be in the Brown Bombers. But when he started to talk, talk about gangs, she turned cold and said, I don't want nothing to do with gangs. Gangs did bad things to me and my mother. Curly tried to explain her that the bombers weren't like that, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't listen. She didn't like gangs, and so, and so he didn't want to she stop talking to her about them. They talked about movies instead. She had seen a lot of movies she had never heard of, movies that were independent, as she called them, a lot of gay films she watched with her American mother and her kids. But the only thing she really loved was Star Trek The Next Generation. Not the old one, or the one where they're lost in space, but the one with Data. She loved Data because she saw a lot of herself in him. He didn't, she didn't understand things like him. At the same time, he was the most lovable one of them all. Curly had only seen the new Star Treks, so he knew he had the Netflix the series. It was old, dating these kids, they're 13, from the 90s or something. And she made it sound so good. When the sun started to go down, she said she had to go home, or Hal would be worried. Curly offered to walk her home. She accepted, and he walked her to an old house on Miller Street that still had a window unit hanging out the front window. Had a big fence and a gate around it, carport, weird ramp for the front door, which she explained was used when Hal's grandfather used to live there. He was old, when he was old, and couldn't move. When they got to the gate, Curly could see someone inside cooking dinner. It smelled good. So, Curly said, looking into her eyes. Yes. She said, starting to blush, you know, he wanted to kiss her. She wanted that too, but she had never been kissed before. She didn't know who was, was supposed to go first. Can I kiss you? Curly just blurted out, feeling his heart almost jumping out of his chest. She blew, smiled and blushed and said timidly, yes. Curly leaned in and their lips touched for just a few seconds before her voice called out. She, come inside, dinner's ready. She pulled back. She liked the, the kiss, but Hal startled her when he heard her when he called her inside. He really he really liked the way her Curly really liked the way her lips felt and just stood there stupidly watching as she opened the gate and closed it. She petted a, a little weenie dog and walked inside. Curly smiled all the way back home and thought about nothing but she and watching Star Trek. When Curly got home, he saw several police cars outside of his house. Curly's heart dropped, thinking he was busted for stealing that black box. But he saw Derek and Chewie in handcuffs, with Ricky crying with a cop. Ricky's a girl, she's also a member of the gang. She had blood all over her face, and Derek and Chewie were all beat up. Ramon, who's the leader, was nowhere to be found. And so he looked in the back of one of the, carrier, of the cursed cruisers and saw Ramon there looking pissed and stone cold. Curly didn't know what to do, if he should go in the house or ask the guys what happened. Before he could make a decision, his abuela called him in and told him to get in the house. He walked inside with his abuela and asked her several questions about what happened. She only said that she would explain everything when the cops left. But right now, he had to stay in the house and be quiet. He watched from the window and looked out toward the garage as the cops put Derek and Chewie in the back of their cruisers and left. Ricky was taken by ambulance. Curly went to his room, opened up his laptop, and started watching Star Trek. This incident in his front lawn might have bothered him if it didn't, if it didn't happen all the time here. His abuela never told him anything, but he knew that when Ramon got home that he would give him the scoop. Curly had stayed up to three in the morning watching most of the first season. He liked it, 
but he thought the special effects were cheesy compared to the CGI stuff, the new movies had. But the stories were good, and he liked Worf the best. He was awesome. Troy was super hot, him and Yard. He killed her off really quick. So I'm going to skip ahead here. So Curly goes to try to meet her the next day. Curly was nervous when he met up with C. She met him at the library at lunch, like they've been doing for a week now. But she didn't smile this time when she came over. She didn't look happy at all. She had sat down at the table opposite from him and plopped down a small brown book on the table. You're a stealer, she said angrily. Curly had no idea what she was talking about. What do you mean? And then he thought she knows about the black box. She stole these poems. She stole these poems she said you wrote. How do you, how do you know that? It was all Curly could think of. These poems come from this book here. It was written by a poet here. She took her, you took her poems and made, told me they were yours. You're a stealer. Curly knew he was busted, so he told her the whole story about the initiation of the black box. She didn't seem to care. All she said was, I thought you were a nice guy. I hate gangs. What you're doing was wrong. You have to give the box back. He's, but I love poetry now, she would, like Curly says. In Star Trek, I do. She got up and left and said goodbye. I never want to talk to you again. Curly tried to stop her, but it was too late. She was gone, and he was feeling horrible. The rest of the day, Curly was in a daze trying to find a way to solve this problem. He didn't know what to do, so he went home and spent the whole weekend watching all of Star Trek. Curly then made a decision. He walked back to the house. He had taken the black box from him, and he knocked on the door. A tall, dark-skinned woman answered the door. Yes, she said. Curly said, about two weeks ago, I took this from outside your house as you were moving in. I'm here to return it. I'm sorry. The woman looked at him for a second and said, you want to come in? I have Ala Fesca. Curly nodded and went inside. This is one important drink. And I asked him why he took it. Curly explained again about the initiation. And then told her his whole story about falling in love with she and his new interest in poetry and Star Trek. The woman just listened. And as he talked, he didn't say a word until he was done. And then she asked him something strange. She says, have you started writing your own poetry? Curly lowered his head, looked at his glass, and said, yeah, that's not good. Come on, share it with me. It's, it's not good. Let me be the judge. Curly took out his little notebook and read his little poem about the color blue. It was only four lines long, and he spent hours writing it, his little poem. Blue, it breathes and it feels like a prisoner on this last day, right before the door is open and he knows that all is holy. The woman nod, nodded her head and said, that was really good. Now let me tell you a story. I was raised on Mooney Street just down the road from where you live. That, you know that burnt out light down the road there? Yeah, you curly nods. That was my house when I was a little girl. But when that house burned down, we moved in with my rich uncle in McCallum. Everything in that house was expensive. We weren't allowed to touch anything. But then one day my uncle showed me a book of poetry he wrote when he was young. It was at that moment that I knew that Ross could write and have books. I never knew my uncle wrote, and now he was showing me his poetry. I read it and fell in love with poetry from that point on. I was 10 years old. I spent my life studying and writing ever since. A lot of it is bad, but the good stuff I publish. But the story I want to tell you is when I was 20. My uncle told, told me that his college mentor was dying and I had to meet him before he before he passed. He was one of those old school Chicanos who marched in all the marches. And he became a professor who taught the, to teach the Dasa how to organize and inspire new generations of Chicanos. He wanted what the movement wanted, Chicanos succeeding. So Ernesto, that's my uncle, took me to his home, which was nice, but not as nice as my uncle. He was pretty much bedridden, and he needed one of those oxygen tanks to breathe. He smiled when he saw me, and they talked about the old days, which I didn't know. Talked about all the Chicanos in power and how many of them were corrupt. They were getting put in prison and removed, like Sylvia Handy and others. Then he said something I did not expect. He said it was his fault. That was the fault of all the old school Chicanos who mentored the young ones back in the day. They taught all of these politicians, sheriffs, DAs, and they taught them to do whatever it takes to get things done because everything was stacked against them. Because that's how they had to do it in the 60s. They had to do whatever it took. And sometimes that meant doing the wrong thing. It was playing the game, and the only way they knew how were bribes and intimidations. 
and Curly interrupts him like gangs, you know, like gangs, dealers, gangsters. Now they're all going to jail. They like the money too much. They like the power too much. They were acting like they had won the game, but the game isn't rigged for Chicanos. It's rigged against them. And the more they played with the game with their roles, the more they became everything they said they were. And then after the Salt School of Chicano was done, my, my uncle stood up and said, you know what he said? I said, no, what did he say? He said, but you also made me. And Chicano who did put things right, fought the battle for poetry, for success. The woman paused for a second, looked at Curly, who was deep in thought at this point. Curly asked, well, what's a Chicano? How to become one? That's something you're going to have to learn for yourself. Keep on reading books, read about our history, through our words. But most of all, you have to drop the stupid gang shit and get that girl back. She'll be your guide. She already seems to like she knows she's ahead of this game. But the the ground bombers is all I want to be. I don't know how to get out. It says, Curly, at this point, she says, um, do you know what? When I was a kid, I was like you. I had the painted eyebrows and dickies, the whole thing. But because of my uncle, I left all that behind. It doesn't mean being a child that is bad. It isn't. It just means you're choosing your own path. Look here, keep the box. I don't need it anymore. Are you sure? It's got like personal stuff in there too. Yeah, I'm sure. It's going to do you more good than it will me. Curly got up, apologized one last time, scooped up the box and left. He didn't know what to think about what just happened. He thought she was going to call the cops on him, yell at him or something. But she said, did something far worse. She opened his eyes to a different path. So when Curly walked home, contemplating everything she had told him, he walked. He went up to. He got up to his house, and he saw all four of the ground bombers sitting in the garage, smoking weed, laughing. Derek and Chewy and even Ricky was in there. Same old, same old. But this time, instead of walking into the garage and hanging out with them like he usually did, he went inside, sat down with his abuela, and the black box sat between them. Kafka fans in the audience. They don't really teach Kafka anymore in school. They used to. So I'm a huge Kafka fan. So I've taken Kafka's story and I've kind of just style and made it tell the story here. And um, so this one's called Exile. It starts off with a quote by Franz Kafka. Um, the quote is Every revolution evaporates and leaves behind only the slime of the new bureaucracy. Kafka. So if you know Kafka's style, he never has last names. <laughs> it's just always, was it Joseph K? Right? Greg, Greg or M. So that's, that's the main character's name, Louis Sam. Louis Sam sat outside the courthouse doors waiting. He had been waiting here for an over an hour, and still the doors never opened. There were several other people waiting in the hallways, some sitting, some leaning against the wall, staring at their phones, probably on Facebook, Twitter, or Say Pokemon Go. <laughs> um, the others started, stared blankly into space or preoccupied themselves with dozens of children running wild up and down the hallways. Louis Sam didn't know how long these people had been waiting before he got here, but he knew it had been a long time. Some he even thought it looked like they had been here since before the place opened. Louis looked down at his hands and felt the urge to pull out his phone and check his email. He didn't want to miss his chance to get inside and clear this whole matter up. The whole thing it started two weeks ago. It was a morning like any other, hot, humid, and all around the same as any other in blistering South Texas, kind of late. <laughs> but on this particular day, before even his alarm went off, he heard the knock on the front door. It was steady and insistent like a woodpecker, but this was much more forceful. Luis slowly made his way out of bed and, um, and over to the door. He opened it to see two men dressed in black suits, white shirts, and black fedora hats with dark shades, white skin to contrast all the darks. It was odd because no one ever wore suits in the valley, just too unbearable. But here they were, not even sweating the drop. The guy on the right spoke first. Luis M, he answered yes. You're under arrest, step aside. The guy on the left said as he pushed him aside. Baffled, Luis M asked, what do you mean? What have I done? The two other guys didn't answer. They just looked around his apartment, tossing books off the shelves smashing plates and glasses and rifling through his things. Hey, excuse me, I know my rights. You guys just can't come in here and do this without telling me what I'm charged with. The guy who was originally on the left stopped. 
came right up to his face and said, Sir, you have no rights. You're under arrest. Now sit down. I'll have to restrain you. Luis didn't know what to do, so he sat down on the sofa. And while they, lived, while they went all over it for about 20 minutes and trashed his entire apartment, he took his flash drives, photos, books, and even his leftover cup. Well, the boss left one boy I had saved for lunch. When they were finished, they turned to him, and the guy on the left said, We'll begin the summons soon. I suggest you get a lawyer. These charges are quite serious. What charges? Luis pleaded with him, but they're already out the door. Luis didn't know what to do, so he didn't know who these guys were, what they wanted. Ultimately, he decided to call the cops because there's only kind of, some kind of strange home invasion. So he got on his phone and dialed 911. A woman's voice came over the line. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, some guys just came into my house and trashed it. They said I was under arrest and they just left. Mr. M, you are under arrest. Please don't call here again. You'll be getting the summons at your place of employment. Go to work and get a lawyer. That was all. She was gone and this nightmare continued. Luis got ready for work, tried to pick up as much as possible. He had to get but he, so he got his coffee and the one mug that wasn't broken jumped in his car. He got to the bank where he worked as a loan officer and everyone looked at him weird. He didn't know why, but no one looked at him in the eye. They just kept their gauges down and continued about their business. Luis then got to his desk and noticed there was an official letter from the government sitting nice and neat on his computer keyboard. It was stamped and certified, all official. Luis sat at his desk and opened it up. All it said was, you have been exiled. Please go about your work. We'll be contacting you for a court date. P.S. Get a lawyer. Luis was completely disturbed by this because it was written on official government documents and letterhead from the Department of Homeland Affairs. He didn't know what it meant or what he was supposed to do, so he decided to talk to his friend Mike, who was who worked in legal. Mike was sitting at his desk with a stack of huge dot matrix printed binders of information on them. Luis knocked on the door and asked, Mike, can I talk to you? I've been having a weird day. Mike looked up at him like he'd seen a ghost. Sorry, Luis, can't talk. You're a marked man. Mike, what do you mean? It's, it's me, what's going on? Luis, Mike gestured to the corner of the ceiling. I, I can't talk to you. Please just go and have a smoke break. Luis looked up and saw a camera mounted in that corner. Something was really weird was happening. First, because he didn't smoke, and second, the smoking was pretty much outlawed. Luis then went out to the side area where the last remaining smokers congregated and stood there waiting. A minute later, Mike came out and pulled Luis aside so no one could hear. Luis, what have you done? There's agents crawling all over the place and putting surveillance everywhere. I haven't done anything. I don't know what's going on. All I know is these guys came in suits to my house, told me I was under arrest, and then they left. I came here, and there's this letter sitting on my, and it said, letter sitting on my desk, and it said I'm in exile, but I should go back to work. What the hell is this? Mike looks scared. You're not the first, and you won't be the last. They're cleaning house. Who? What are you talking about? I can't explain more. You'll know I've been gone. Go see Carlos Adama, he can help. Who's that? Just then, the side, blind, the side door burst open, the same two agents burst out and grabbed Mike and pulled him inside. The one on the left turned to Luis as they were pulling Mike inside and said, you're not allowed to collude with others. What, what are you talking about? Luis pled, but no, once again, he was gone. He was extremely frustrated at this point. So he did the only thing he could think of. He went back to work. He never saw or heard from Mike again. He was just gone. And still, Louis said no answers to what's going on. So he finished his day and he left to find Carlos Adami. He found him easily enough because he had billboards all over town so he could get money from anyone money for slips and falls in both English and Spanish. Carlos was a lawyer who worked at a barber shop deep in Little Mexico, the Mexican side of the town. He had several clients in his waiting room that could have sworn to kill people. And they were looking at him like he was Richard Rodriguez. But then his secretary was the same girl who took the haircut at times. She was around 20, light brown skin, long glowing, brown, blondish brown hair, low top, low cut top, and a short green skirt. Louis hoped that the lawyer's sleazy choice of a legal assistant didn't reflect his practice, but he was sure it did. You know, it took about 10 minutes before he got called back. Adama had been living like a guy who had had an office in a barber shop. He had a nice brother suit, well manicured, expensive shoes. This guy looked like he belonged in that big black tower downtown. Carlos looked at him and said, So you're in exile, huh? 
Luis sat down in front of his big mahogany desk and said, yeah, that's me, what does that mean? Carlos interlaced his fingers, leaned back in his leather chair and said, well, that's what we're going to find out. But I'll be honest with you, no one who's ever kept their code date has ever been seen from again. What do you mean, they went to prison? Prison? No. They're just gone, vanished, deleted from the system. I don't understand. I, don't, I didn't do anything. Didn't you? What do you mean? I haven't done anything illegal. This isn't a crime we committed. This is about something much worse. What's that? You're in exile. Your entire existence is a threat, a threat to the fabric of society. But why? He leans, uh, Carlos leans in and says, have you ever heard of a homo sacred? No, what's that? It's an ancient Roman legal designation for someone's both sacred and cursed at the same time. It was used for people who could not exist in society, but the government could not write just kill them either. They're banned, and yet they're somehow deemed worthless enough by society. So anybody who kind of kills them wouldn't be tried for murder, but at the same time, they couldn't be sacrificed for a cause. That's confusing. That's you. I don't understand any of this, Luis said, bursting out. Can anyone give me a straight answer? If things were that simple, you wouldn't need me. How many of your clients are exiles? All of them. Have you gotten any of them off? Not yet. You're still waiting for the court date. Luis was more frustrated than ever. This lawyer had done nothing to complicate the matter. Luis looked at Carlos and asked, so what do I do? Wait for a court date and then call me. You're going to represent me? Sure, but I won't be here. Uh, I won't be there. I'm just here to file paperwork. What do you mean? So I just go to the courthouse by myself? Don't you need to mount a defense or anything? There is no defense. Luis left his office, feeling helpless. And there were no answers for him, but yet he had to fight this. Somehow there had to be a way. So Luis searched the internet, read several books on exiles, went back time and time again to the courthouse to try to get answers. But he was always turned away. He went back to his lawyer's office and played with him, but Carlos would only tell him the same thing. There was nothing he could do for him. So after about two weeks of going about his life as an exile, he finally got his date in court. It was a letter presented on his desk the same way he received his exile letter. He was told to go to, go to the courthouse and wait, so he did. He waited for years and years, yet the line at the courthouse never seemed to get shorter. He waited for more years and the line never moved. It was after several more years that he decided to go home. He stood up, feeling his legs wobbly, because he'd been sitting for years and waiting to get his bearings. When he took the first step, it was difficult, but after a while, the blood rushed, rushed back into his legs and began to walk faster and faster at the front door. Hundreds of people waiting for years like him watched as he walked toward the doors. No one had ever left. It was a sight to see. And as he got closer to the big double doors, a hush fell over the crowd. It was so silent that Luis had to turn to look at our see if everyone was still there. They were. So he pushed the door open. So he pushed for the he pushed on the door for it to open and it did. He opened the door and blinding light filled his vision. The light caused Luis to close his eyes until they adjusted to the brightness of the sun. It was the first time he'd seen the daylight in years. His eyes burned for a few seconds. Then he took a step outside. When he did, all he saw were two agents again and had burst into his house. They grabbed him, pulled him into a black SUV, with tinted windows. They didn't even say a word. They drove and drove until they ended up at Boca Chica Beach. The, the beach was completely deserted. Not a single living soul was around. They pulled him out, took his shoes off, and told him to walk toward the crashing waves. Luis didn't know, didn't want to, but his agents looked like they wanted to kill him, so he did. He had a feeling that if, uh, if he ran, they would just shoot him dead. He walked until the cold water splashed over his feet, and then one of the agents said, stop, get on your knees, and so he did. He heard the slide of the barrel being pulled back. The click of the hammers was locked in place, and right before he heard the bang, something miraculous happened. Off in the distance, down on the beach toward the Mexican side, he saw a flash of light and a huge puff of smoke. Something rose from the horizon. It was a rocket, and what followed was a sonic boom. It was the last thing he felt before he closed his eyes and waited. And so he waited, and waited, and he waited. Thank you. So that's just, uh, those are the most few stories I was going to for you guys. I don't know if there's like a question and answer session or anything. <laughs> if you guys want to ask anything, questions, comments, yeah.